All right, good morning, everybody. I'm apologizing in advance. Uh, for some reason, I'm slightly healthier of the two of us, but it's only slightly. Uh, if I start, I, I will probably start coughing at some point during this, so excuse me for that. But anyway, uh, we're going to talk today about this idea of light and dark. And I don't know about you, but when I hear this idea of light and dark, I immediately, my mind goes to light bulb jokes. Doesn't it go to you? No? Well, it does for me, so you're going to hear it anyway. You're going to get to hear For example, for example, and this is the old how many, in this case, how many bosses does it take to put in a light bulb? The answer is three, because you need one to get the bulb, one to look up a phone number, and one to call somebody to actually do it. How many telemarketers does it take to put in a light bulb? Only one, but they can only do it during your dinner time. Right. How about how many government workers does it take? Sorry if you work for the government. The answer is 45. One to put in the light bulb and 44 to do all the paperwork that's around you. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. How many New Yorkers does it take to put in a light bulb? None of your business. <laughs> How many chiropractors does it take? Only one, but it takes them 15 visits to get it in. <laughs> okay, you'll like this one. How many lawyers does it take to put in a light bulb? And the answer, how many can you afford? <laughs> That one might actually be true. Anyway, last couple, I promise. How many men, sorry guys, how many men does it take to put in a light bulb? The answer is only one. He holds it up in the socket and wait for the world to revolve around him. <laughs> Joyce made me do that one. Joyce said I had to put that one in if I was going to do this. Uh, how many, but really, how many real men does it take to put in a light bulb? The answer is zero, because real men aren't afraid of the dark. There you go. And let's end on this. How many real women does it take to put in a light bulb? Zero, because they have a real man around to do it for them. All right, that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this idea of light and darkness, and I, I'm just going from the lectionary. I know we've been going from the lectionary, and that's all I'm doing here. So this is scripture you're probably familiar with, but uh, that's okay, because it's, uh, uh, I think we can get things out of scripture, and I'm going to concentrate on a part of it that I don't think we normally concentrate on. And this is scripture from the book of John, from chapter 3, and it's Nicodemus. Nicodemus coming to Jesus. And you probably know already Nicodemus. He's a Jewish leader. He's learned in the law and the scripture. And he comes to Jesus at night. And it's very important that's in the scripture that he comes at night to see Jesus. And he comes to Jesus and begins in Jesus because he wants to know what's going on with Jesus and his ministry. And Jesus kind of gives him a Christianity 101 lesson, uh, the basics in Christianity. And so that's the scripture we're going to use, and there's a concept about this idea of light and dark that I want to talk about a little bit. But before we get there, there's a very important concept that I know we already know, but let's talk about it because it's an important concept to have in our mind first before we get to what I want to talk about. And it's, again, it's, it's Jesus teaching Nicodemus, and he's been teaching him some stuff about Christianity that Nicodemus clearly doesn't seem to understand completely. He's having some problems with the idea of being born again, for example, and he questions Jesus about this. But now we get to the part where Jesus is going to, <coughs> excuse me, switch tactics a little bit and use something that Nicodemus would recognize. So we go to the scripture here, and this is verse 14, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Okay, so the concept, obviously, that Jesus is teaching Nicodemus about is that you uh, you get eternal life. God grants you eternal life simply for your belief in him. It is belief in Jesus that gets us to eternal life. 
That is how we are saved. That is how we are forgiven in God, is by our belief in Christ. Now, this reference about a snake being lifted up in the desert doesn't make much sense to our ears, but to Nicodemus, this would have made a lot of sense because he was very knowledgeable about the Old Testament. And this is a story from the Old Testament. This is a story from Numbers chapter 21. And what happens is, I know this sounds familiar, that the Israelites are going through the wilderness, and believe it or not, they're actually complaining. They're complaining because they're in the wilderness. And this is after God has warned them many times, you've got to stop this, and Moses has tried to stop them. You've got to stop this grumbling. You've got to stop this complaining. God has, is leading us. Have faith in God. And this was a sign that the people were not putting all their faith in God. And so God sent uh, a plague, <coughs> excuse me, to the people of Israel. Poisonous snakes came and started biting people, and people started actually dying. And so Moses, as he was wont to do, goes to God and says, God, we are sorry. These people, we have made a huge mistake, and they are very sorry for what they have done. Could you please lift this curse from us? And God obliges Moses and says, make a snake, put it on top of a staff, as you see here, and anybody who is bitten, look at that snake, and they will live. Those are the words that God uses. If they look at the snake, they will live. And so to Nicodemus, this made sense to him. This idea of the snake being lifted up, and people looked on it, and they lived. And now Jesus is saying, there's an analogy here, that he will be lifted up, and looking upon him or believing in him, you will live. Now, not just physically live, but this is talking about eternal life. But you get the analogy. You get the comparison that he's making here. And so that's the concept he's trying to teach to Nicodemus. This idea, <coughs> excuse me, that belief in him leads to eternal life. Which leads to Jesus saying the famous, you know, the, what we know very well, John 3, 16. He's telling this to Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So, I think we're all aware of that. But it's a very important concept you have to understand before we get into the next part of this. Because you have to understand the concept that there is nothing that is going to change this idea that we are saved simply through our belief in Christ. There's no task we can do, there's no work we can do that is going to get our salvation, that is going to grant our salvation to us. We can't work ourselves to heaven. We all know that. It is simply our belief in Christ that gets us there. But of course, Nicodemus didn't understand this. That's why Jesus is explaining it to him. So, but under, you need to keep that in mind because the next thing we're going to talk about sometimes confuses some people. Things get a little messed up. So keep that in mind. It is your belief that saves you. So now Jesus is going to introduce this concept of light and dark to Nicodemus to make an impact on him, to hopefully have something that he can understand. <clears throat> and so he starts out with this scripture. He says, this is the verdict, Jesus says. Light has come into the world. Now let me stop right there because Jesus is talking about himself. He is the light. God has sent him into a dark world, the dark world where sin exists. Have you ever been in a really dark, dark place and there's even just a little bit of light comes on? It illuminates everything, doesn't it? It is amazing how much just a little bit of light will do in a really dark place. And Jesus is saying now he is the light introduced into total darkness in the world and of course it's going to light up everything. He is the ultimate light. And so he says to Nicodemus, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. 
And then we end with this, but whoever lives by truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Now, I don't know. I was reading that on purpose a certain way. I was trying to emphasize those words, does and deeds. Did you notice that? Did you notice that there's Jesus is talking here about action? He's talking about action. So he's, his words, <coughs> excuse me, his words imply a type of action here. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you are judged, you are seen by what you do. Men are living in darkness because their deeds were evil. They are living in the light because what they are doing is in the light and can be clearly seen by God and is, you know, is shown to God. And so he's implying some type of action for these people. And this is where people get confused. People get confused. They say, wait a minute. Jesus is just saying your belief is what saves you. And now he's saying your actions are involved here. But it makes perfect sense if you understand it this way. We are good United Methodists, and so United Methodists firmly believe that what actions are, are evidence of our belief. That if you truly believe, if you truly have Christ in your heart and that belief in your heart, then your actions are going to be evidence of that belief. It doesn't mean that your actions are what gets you to heaven. It means those actions are evidence of the belief that gets you eternal life. And so that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about living in the light. Because if you go to 1 Peter, if you go to Peter, Peter says this as well. 1 Peter 2, 9 says this. You, and he's talking to all of us here, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So what Peter is saying, and what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is, I am calling you out of the darkness and into the light. You are living in darkness. You are living in sin. Your actions are such that you are doing what is not right in God's eyes. And it's very important, as I told you before, that Nicodemus comes to Jesus under cover of darkness. That is very important for this scripture because you see, he's hiding his actions. Yes, he's going to Jesus, but he's hiding it from everybody. He doesn't want anybody to see that he's going to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not the way it's done. We're, I call you into the light. God calls you into the light. I want everybody to see that you're doing this. This is not something that you should be hiding from everybody. You should be living this way, yes, but you should be doing it in the light. You should be doing it so that everybody can see. And what he's really saying is you should be living your life in a way that is evidence of your belief and you should be living that way regardless of the situation you're in. Regardless of the position that you are in. Because what he's saying is sometimes, let's be honest, we treat God as a very small being. We really do. We treat God as if God is our neighbor or somebody in our family. Because what, what do we do? What do we do? Honestly, what do we do? We tend to go into our houses and we lock our doors and we close our blinds. And then a lot of times we do things or say things or act on things that maybe aren't really evidence of our faith in Jesus Christ. And we know in our hearts that that's hidden from our neighbors. We can hide that from them. We can hide it even from sometimes from our family and even from our spouses at times. But realistically, we can't hide that from God, but we act like we can. And what Jesus is telling Nicodemus is, and he's telling us the same thing, he's saying to Nicodemus, what do you do, Nicodemus, what do you do in your life that you hide from everybody else? And he's asking that question to us as well. And nobody knows the answer to this question but you, but you and God. This is between you and God. And it's a question that Jesus is asking you. He's saying to you, what are you doing in your life that you don't want the spotlight shined on? What are you doing that's like that? What are you doing in the darkness? 
Because Jesus is saying, I am calling you to my light. I'm calling you to myself. That is the light. I'm calling you to that. Come to that light. Live in the light. We always taught our girls growing up, this is the truth, you can ask them, it's any time you want, you can ask them, and we always taught them. We always said, hey, when you're growing up, when, you, you know, when they were growing up, we would say, you should act like somebody is watching you at all times. That is the best way for you to live your life, because frankly, a lot of times they are. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret since they're not here right now. The little secret was we would send them to school and we would convince them that we have spies everywhere in the school. We would let them know. And, and actually, it worked out fantastically because we would get like one report. All we would need is one report from somebody and we would say, mm-hmm. I heard that you were in this group and you were making fun of this girl at lunchtime. That's all we would need. And they would be like, what? You really do have spies there. Now we didn't, we just happened to get lucky with that one thing. But it was fantastic. We, could, we really did use that to say, you know, live your life as if somebody is watching you at all times. And I think that's ultimately what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Live your life as if the light is always shining on you because it is. God is with us. If we truly believe in Christ, God is with us through the Holy Spirit within us. And so the light is on us at all times. And so Jesus is calling us to live in his light. Now, one more thing. One more thing that is very important. Because a lot of people hear this, you know, they say, okay, I believe in God, so yes, that's what is the key to my salvation. And then my actions are evidence of that. And then, I, then we bring up this idea that, yes, but what are you doing in your life that you're hiding, that is in the dark? And naturally, and I do the same thing, you go, oh my word, I've really kind of messed up. I've done things that really I don't want to be in the spotlight. And I need to change that. And so we get scared about that. But don't forget, we tend to stop reading sometimes at John 3, 16. But don't forget John 3, 17 that I read for you earlier. And what does that say? That says that God sent Jesus in the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And so you're not being told this to say you are condemned for what you have done in the darkness. But what he's saying is, stop that. I'm telling you this to save you, to call you into the light, to call you into living in my light, in God's light in the world, and living in a way that is evidence of your faith in Jesus Christ at all times. So you're not told this to condemn you. You're not told it to condemn you. You're told this so that you too can be saved so that all of us can be saved, so that anybody can be saved. And this is the message that we need to convey to the world. You are saved through your belief, but your actions are evidence of that belief. And if you let God into your heart, if you let God and you let God work on you and transform you and change you, you too will live your life in a way that you don't care. Put the spotlight on me at all times. It's all right. In fact, I want the spotlight on me. I want God's light shining on me because it is my way of spreading God's word through the world, through my actions. Amen.